try. Welcome to session number 19 of uh, Introduction to Christian Doctrine. Uh, I'm Dr. John McMath, and uh, we're here with, uh, with our friends in uh, the Philippines and in Italy, uh, looking at the basics of Christian doctrine. This is a college level course, uh, but uh, uh, no credit and no graduation because uh, here in the uh, Lord Jesus Philippine Fellowship, the learning never stops. And so we just, we just keep going. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, what the lecture title calls the components of salvation. We're going to be looking at definitions of terms for a couple of sessions uh, today. And then again on Wednesday, we'll be looking at definitions. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the all of the arguments on one side of another of, of everything. There are some there are some broad strokes that we can take. Uh, but I'm not going to look at everything. Uh, theologians love to argue. Uh, and if you put uh, five theologians in a room with a topic to consider, uh, you'll get nine different opinions, uh, and some of them will agree uh, will disagree with themselves. Uh, I, I love these guys, but sometimes I don't understand the mindset. Um, uh, I tend to look for the uh, biblical definition uh, before I look for uh, the, the various approaches of the theologians, but I will, will give you some theologian definitions too, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, today, we're going to look at uh, justification, imputation, adoption, and sanctification, and this will take us a, a good solid hour. So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm already recording, so I'm going to share the screen, see if we can make this work. Yes, share, bingo. Oh, look at that, that was quick. Okay, the components of salvation, justification, imputation, adoption, and sanctification. Now, these aren't necessarily in any particular order. Um, there's a lot of relationship between them, but we'll be uh, just working through uh, the stack. Uh, in our uh, last section, we talked about the order of salvation, or what we call the ordo salutis. Uh, and, uh, the, all of the stuff that happens together a uh, matter of fact, let me go back to that slide so we can think about it for just a moment. This is just a hand-drawn slide. Uh, this is a reminder that the, the process of salvation, the elements in the process are fairly complex. There's a lot going on here. Uh, we're going to be looking at justification today along with sanctification and then a couple of terms that aren't even on this diagram uh, adoption and imputation uh, all of these words fit somewhere in the process uh, one of the uh, the great errors that uh, particularly new christians make uh, when they're they're trying to understand how salvation works uh, is to oversimplify now sometimes when you're sharing the gospel you're just trying to uh, to share the basics with uh, somebody that you've been praying for for a while you want to oversimplify but when you're actually trying to understand for yourself uh, what the bible teaches uh, and how it all fits together, uh, it makes sense to slow down and to unpack uh, and to see how everything, everything in the in the whole complex fits together. Uh, yesterday afternoon and uh, uh, and this morning, I've been working on 
uh, changing the the brake pads in my car. Uh, and uh, I haven't done a brake job in a long, long time. Uh, and so when I started taking it apart, I worked very slowly. I looked at every single part. Uh, I laid those parts out as I was taking the old parts off of each uh, uh, brake rotor. Uh, I was looking at those pads, I was looking at the backing plates, I was looking at the difference between one backing plate and another. There's a little metal clip that has to fit just exactly right. The uh, caliper has to fit in exactly the right way. Everything has to fit and everything is different and everything goes in a certain order. Uh, and we, uh, uh, those of us who are forced to work on our own cars, learn to respect that. Well, I would argue that uh, our salvation is much more complex uh, than a brake job on the car. Uh, there's a lot of parts uh, and the Bible indicates the order in which these things have to happen. Uh, we often speak of justification by faith, which was the hallmark of the Reformation. Uh, and sometimes people think, well, there's nothing to salvation except that we're justified by faith. And so faith happens, and the result of that is justification. There's quite a bit more going on. Uh, faith is actually when we looked at this earlier, one of the components of conversion. Conversion is the, uh, uh, the visible symptom to regeneration, the new birth. And the new birth is in fact a gift of God by grace. Uh, and that gift uh, is built on the work of Christ which was set out in a plan by God in eternity past, as so God has known and has planned for salvation long before faith ever happened. So yes, we're justified by faith, uh, but that's just two parts of a, of a long process. Today, we're going to look at some, some of those components and see how they all fit together. Let's... Uh, Look at it. First of all, doctrine of justification uh, is really a very big deal. Uh, Martin Luther said that the doctrine of justification is the article upon which the church stands or falls. Uh, and he's right, of course. Uh, the, uh, you know, what he really meant <laughs> is that the uh, the, the relationship of justification to all of the rest of the components of salvation is critical. If we believe that justification is a process beginning with baptism and ending with uh, the, uh, uh, the extreme unction, the last rites of the Catholic Church, uh, and isn't really complete at death, but goes on through purgatory, then, then we hold to a Roman Catholic position. If we believe that uh, justification is a reward for good works, uh, then we're taking another position altogether. Uh, that's an Arminian position. Uh, uh, Luther said this is an important thing. John Calvin who uh, operated in the, uh, the Reformation in Geneva, a generation after Luther, wrote in the Institutes of the Christian Religion that the doctrine of justification by faith is the main hinge on which true religion turns. Uh, Calvin is the uh, Reformation character who did the primary work on the biblical doctrine of justification. Uh, and it's on his work that, that those of us of the, uh, the Reformed and Calvinist tradition primarily stand. Uh, the, the value of Calvin, 
lies in his uh, careful work in the scriptures. Uh, what Calvin did, which is very similar to what uh, Luther did, but, but Calvin wrote more uh, and his writing is more systematic. Uh, what, uh, what Calvin did was to lay down uh, the, the biblical evidence and uh, the biblical argument uh, for the doctrine of justification uh, that we teach today. Uh, and it is really very, very important. Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, Wayne Grudem. The primary issue in the Protestant Reformation was a dispute with the Roman Catholic Church over justification. So uh, let's do a little bit of history here. Luther, 1517, on uh, October 31st, which was Halloween, All Hallows' Eve, uh, uh, on that day, he nailed the 95 Theses to the Wittenberg church door. And the 95 theses written in Latin were an invitation to uh, a debate, a disputation uh, about uh, justification. Uh, what, uh, uh, what the Pope had proposed was that uh, individuals could uh, uh, achieve justification by buying indulgences. Now, an indulgence is a is a papal uh, a papal decree, kind of a papal certificate uh, that says that all of your sins have been forgiven. Uh, is a, the forgiveness of uh, any sin you've ever uh, committed a plenary indulgence. Uh, 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 that would guarantee heaven to anybody who had one. Now, if you could really do that, that would be quite a thing. Luther didn't really disagree that uh, the Pope had that authority. Uh, he was irritated that uh, the Pope would sell the indulgences. Uh, now, Martin Luther uh, grew in his understanding of justification over time, but as he, uh, as he argued and studied the scriptures, uh, he came back to particularly Romans and Galatians uh, to argue that uh, the justification is not a process like the, uh, the Catholic Church taught. Uh, in Catholicism, justification is the same thing as sanctification. It's a process that begins with birth and baptism and continues through life, all the way through life, every time you go to church, every time you, you take the Lord's Supper, every time you get any of the sacraments, uh, any time you're obedient to the Ten Commandments, is a process that takes all of life, uh, depends on little components of the grace of God poking down into life over the whole of life. Uh, this justification process doesn't end with death. And the justification process is entirely dependent on the church not dependent on God so much as the church. The institutional church must go through the motions. The ritual has to be performed properly in order for salvation to happen. If that's true, uh, then salvation can never be assured. You can never really know. Uh, Luther finally came to the conclusion that justification is an event. It happens once uh, and is a step in the, in the process of salvation that is entirely dependent on the work of God. Uh, so at this point, uh, Roman Catholic and Lutheran theology really parted ways. 
the the fundamental issue was the authority for salvation. And uh, Roman Catholics say the final authority is the church. Luther says the final authority is God himself. Now it was Calvin who defined the terms and provided the, the biblical argument, the evidence to support his definitions. Uh, and so we, we work with both Luther and Calvin in, uh, in coming up to this. Uh, the, uh, the issue of justification, the truth of the biblically defined concept of justification is at the core of the gospel. And it really is important that we understand it. So we're going to look at the, the terminology a bit further. Uh, the uh, Old Testament term, uh, tzaddak, uh, righteousness, or the verb form uh, to uh, make a person righteous or to declare a person righteous uh, is uh, actually fairly common in the Old Testament. Uh, we find it... Uh, uh, fairly often, sometimes in just a just a plain legal sense, uh, the uh, the judge would determine that the individual is not guilty, and that's a justification. That's a, a, a sadakia. Uh, the New Testament word is dekayo, uh, which means to declare righteous or to declare not guilty. Uh, the uh, uh, the Greek word is actually quite picturesque. Uh, it has to do uh, with the uh, a very ancient word, a classical Greek word, dike, uh, which is the absolute standard of a plumb bob. Uh, when uh, when we lay a, uh, uh, a hollow block wall, uh, like uh, uh, the men in uh, uh, Manalan in the Philippines are doing right now. Uh, it's important that the wall be as close to vertical as we can make it. Uh, most of the time we use a, uh, a level, a uh, 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 meter long uh, piece of aluminum with, with bubbles, <laughs> you know, little windows with tubes with bubbles in them. Uh, and that will give us something pretty close to level. To get absolutely correct, we can use a plumb bob, a weight on the end of a string that gives us an exactly perpendicular line. And you can measure at the top and the bottom and tell how close you are to, uh, to vertical. Uh, bricklayers use plumb bobs regularly because it, it's cheap and it's very reliable. The Greek word dekaio uh, means to compare something to a standard and to declare that it has met the standard. It has hit the mark. Uh, so it's a pretty good word for what we're trying to say. Uh, it's important to note that neither term has the idea of actually making someone righteous. Uh, both words have to do with the declaration of righteousness. I wonder if they're having trouble with their video because I'm getting a lot of blanks. Okay. Uh, is uh, is every this one is coming through correctly, Donna? Okay, is that from Facebook? That's not in Facebook. That's in Zoom. Okay. I'm watching Facebook. That's what Facebook. okay. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, uh, Donna was wondering if you're getting video. And I know that uh, uh, those of you who've tuned into the Zoom meeting are probably getting video, but it may not be coming through on Facebook, she's telling me. So I don't know what the technology is to do that, uh, but this is, this is where we are. Okay, so um, justification doesn't make us righteous, it declares that righteousness, in fact, has been achieved. Uh, it's a legal term. Uh, the, uh, the scholars like to use the term forensic. A forensic term is a term that's used in a courtroom. 
uh, so when the uh, uh, when the uh, uh, the judge in a courtroom uh, bangs his gavel and said, uh, you know, I, I pronounce you not guilty, that's a justification. That's what the word actually means in all of the places that we see it used in uh, in the Bible. So it's a legal term in which a person is considered reckoned or credited as righteous. We can think of it as the, the process of writing down the not guilty verdict. So-and-so is not guilty and write it in the book. Once it's been written in the book, accounted for or reckoned, then the job is done. Uh, here in the US, we often say, uh, the work isn't finished until the paperwork is done, uh, especially around airplanes. Uh, when I, uh, I go to the hangar you know, every once in a while to teach, and I love to go out in the, the shop and uh, talk to the mechanics as they work. They spend half of their time, it seems, keeping close track of the paperwork for the airplane. So everything that's been done has to be properly noted, complete with serial numbers and all kinds of details uh, for everything that is done to the airplane. Uh, if something is replaced, you have to have a specific note and uh, all kinds of backup stuff. It's very interesting. Uh, the uh, event of justification can be thought of as God himself taking care of the paperwork. <laughs> he writes it in his book, and, uh, and there it is. So it's a legal term or a forensic term. There's a significant amount of modern controversy over uh, the, uh, the nature of justification. Obviously, Roman Catholics believe that uh, it's not a legal term at all. It's a... Uh, a description of the sanctification process. Uh, uh, Arminians uh, believe that uh, the justification uh, is a reward at the end of life for uh, a lifetime of uh, making the right decisions. Uh, and so it is, again, a kind of process, but on a different level. And then there's a, a whole new movement going on out there uh, that uh, most rank and final Christians haven't been introduced to, that we call the new perspective on Paul. Uh, Paul uses the term justification rather a lot, particularly in Romans and Galatians. Uh, and this uh, new perspective, and I won't introduce you to a, to a bunch of it, argues that uh, justification isn't a, a, a forensic term uh, but, but rather is a, a term of uh, uh, making things right. It, it, it's a term that means to, uh, to make things right again, to renew a relationship, sort of. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the uh, New Perspective crowd argues that justification doesn't apply to individuals who are saved, but rather to uh, whole communities, the church is justified, uh, brought into a right relationship with God. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, it, it doesn't fit the biblical usage of the term. Uh, uh, and it doesn't fit the, uh, the larger uh, secular Hebrew and Greek use of the term in courtrooms. Uh, this, this actually is a forensic term, and it has to do with individuals. Uh, uh, so the, the, if you ever run into the modern new perspective uh, material, know that uh, uh, those folks really aren't right. Uh, they sound really good, but they're wrong. Okay, that is. So what is justification? Uh, no, it's not having a clean slate because you've never, ever committed a sin. Uh, Paul says it very clearly, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, none of us are, are perfect, and we don't have a clean slate because we haven't sinned. 
uh, and no, it's not being given the strength to wipe our own slate clean. There's no way I can clean up my own life. Uh, God has to do the work. I can't do the work. I'm incapable. God is capable. Instead, justification is the legal declaration. This is the judge's gavel that in Christ, God has wiped our slates clean for us. So we do, in fact, have a clean slate. Uh, we, we do, in fact, have a, uh, uh, a sanctification quotient that is enough to get us to heaven. Uh, but it's because of the work that God has done in Christ. Okay. In the Old Testament, uh, just uh, one really important verse. I'll show you some other two, but the uh, Genesis 15 verse is the, the most important one. And Abraham believed in the Lord, and he, uh, the Lord, reckoned it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. There are three words in this passage, uh, believe, reckon, and righteous, uh, righteousness, which are uh, the essential elements of the doctrine of justification by faith. Abraham believed or had faith in the Lord. That was his response to the active movement of God in his life. When, when, when God appeared to Abraham and spoke to him, uh, Abraham trusted God. That was his uh, initial reaction to the grace of God in his life. And God accounted it or reckoned it as righteousness. The reckoning or accounting is justification. Uh, he wrote it in his book. Uh, he wrote in the book, Abraham is righteous. He meets the standard, the standard being perfection. Now, we know that after Abraham uh, trusted uh, God, uh, that he went on to do things that were less than perfect. But in God's book, Abraham is ready for heaven. That's what justification essentially is. Abraham believed the promise of God. God credited that faith as justifying faith. Uh, Deuteronomy 25.1, uh, this is uh, how the courtroom uh, part of it comes out. If there's a dispute between men and they go to court, the judges decide their case and they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Deuteronomy 25.1. Uh, so the Old Testament judges were supposed to announce the verdict of either innocence or guilt. And a righteous judge, a good judge, an honest judge, would look at the evidence and listen to the arguments uh, and uh, decide what verdict the evidence supported. The verdict didn't make anyone righteous. It simply announced the finding that this individual was not guilty or that he was guilty. It reveals what's actually there. That's what we mean by the, uh, the forensic use of the term. And we find it both Old Testament and New Testament. The verdict didn't make a person guilty or innocent. innocent. It was the declaration of a person's legal standing before the law. Over in the New Testament, Romans 3 is, of course, important. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So we know that the roots of justification are in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. Uh, what are the standards? Well, God made the standards clear in, uh, in the law. Uh, well, how about the prophets? Uh, Isaiah in particular, but the other prophets uh, to a lesser uh, degree 
are an exposition of Old Testament law. What does righteousness actually look like? The prophets are the ones who uh, declared that to each of their generations. So a fairly important concept. All right, and let's look at the rest of Romans. Uh, even the righteousness of God that is through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. The appropriation of justification is by faith alone, we see in verse 22. That even the righteousness of God through faith. So the roots are in the Old Testament. The appropriation is by faith alone. For there is no distinction. All of sin to fall short of the glory of God. There's verse 23, 323. The, the universality of sin makes justification absolutely necessary. And he goes on, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. A lot of words there, uh, but the key here is that the basis of justification is Christ's atoning work. That's verses 24 and 25. And we can go on. This was to demonstrate his righteousness so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. So the legitimacy of justification is based strictly in God's character alone. God is both just and the justifier. How can God be just if he justifies the ungodly? He can't. He can only justify the one who is in fact just because of his faith in Christ. Uh, and that's a key in verse 26. Where then is boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? A law of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So the summary of justification, it is by faith, not by works in verses 27 and 28. So this is an important passage. Uh, those of you who've been through Romans with me have seen this before. Uh, what, what Paul is laying out here uh, is uh, the foundational statement on the nature of justification itself. Uh, this is what the New Testament actually teaches. Uh, the book of Galatians is uh, uh, very similar. Uh, Galatians 2, 15 and 16 uh, Paul is going to say it this way. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Okay, what's he, what's he saying there? He's saying essentially the same thing that he said in Romans. Uh, uh, we're, we're not justified by works, but rather by faith. We're justified by faith in Christ, not the works of the law. Uh, and uh, doing good works of the law is not the way to earn salvation. It can't be done. The Roman Catholic uh, concept of justification needs to be examined for just a couple of slides. Uh, it's the idea that justification is an infusion of grace. That's the words that uh, Catholics actually use an infusion of grace, which results in a change of nature uh, such that a person can merit God's favor. So God does the grace thing uh, built on the sacrifice of Christ that because the, uh, uh, the sinner is uh, going through the sacraments, things like uh, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper uh, and uh, confirmation and, and the rest, going through the sacraments, uh, that original sin is gradually 
taken care of and the individual is given the ability to love God. And this cooperation with God leads to more grace and it becomes a, a, a circle. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the individual uh, learns how to work out his salvation. So uh, in the Roman Catholic uh, 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 concept, uh, of course, salvation is by grace. Justification is also by faith. Faith is defined as a cooperation with God. So if you ask Roman Catholics, do you believe in justification by faith? Of course they do. Is this built on the grace of God? Well, obviously it is. They simply define their terms uh, a bit differently and significantly differently uh, than we do. Okay, yeah, the Lord's Supper. Only they don't use uh, good old fashioned Italian bread. <laughs> it's, yeah, okay. Uh, a summary of justification. Justification presupposes a recognition of the reality of God's wrath. We believe that God is actually angry with sin. It's a declarative or judicial act, not a process. Uh, so God does the, this thing at the climax of the salvation event. Justification is received by faith alone and is not in any way merited by good, good works. Justification is based on the substitutionary work of Christ for us. It involves the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us. We'll talk about imputation in just a moment. In justification, God's mercy and justice come together. Mercy is uh, providing for us or withholding from us that which we so rightly deserve. Justice is holding us to a standard that is impossibly high. Uh, uh, two very important words. Uh, uh, God is just and he is also merciful. Justification can never be separated from sanctification. These are two big words. Uh, that we have to keep separate. Uh, they work together, uh, but they are distinct aspects of our salvation. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, the key points that we need to understand is that in the Roman Catholic view, justification and sanctification are uh, confused. Uh, the big word we use is conflated. Uh, they're, they're superimposed so that justification is sanctification. As sanctification is the process of justification. The Bible actually speaks separately of a justification event and a sanctification process. We'll look at sanctification in, a, in just a bit. Uh, imputation is related to justification. Uh, the, the Greek word is uh, logizomai. Uh, we don't really have uh, a Hebrew word that I'm going to show you, uh, but it's, it, it means to write a thing down. Uh, logizomai is to reckon, to account, to calculate, uh, to make a record of a thing. Uh, so it's a legal term usually which signifies holding guilt or innocence against someone. So there's a judge with his funny wig and he's about to bang the gavel uh, and he's about to impute either guilt or innocence. Um, he's not making the individual guilty. He was guilty already. He's not making the individual innocent. He's innocent already. The judge simply recognizes the truth based on the evidence and the argument. In economics, the term signifies a crediting of a sum to an account. Uh, so if, uh, uh, if, uh, if a friend gives me uh, a thousand pesos uh, and uh, uh, he sends it to uh, my bank account, uh, I should be able to look on the computer 
as either a thousand pesos has been credited or imputed to my account. There it is. Uh, the logizomai or imputation simply means to make a note of, to do the paperwork on a guilt or innocence, uh, the, uh, the amount of money in a, in a bank account, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and it's a very important thing. Uh, if you've ever had uh, a, a dispute with the bank over how much money is in the account, uh, you know how important it is to get it right. Uh, this is, this is a, a big deal. An illustration of this, uh, Philemon. Uh, this, a little book of Philemon is just absolutely wonderful. Uh, Philemon 1.8. Actually, Philemon verse 8. It's only the one chapter long. Uh, Paul tells his disciple Philemon, who's a, a rich man in Ephesus, to charge any debts accrued by his runaway slave, a character named Onesimus, to my account. Let's look at what that, that really means. Martin Luther wrote it this way, and this is an old translation into King James English. So uh, Martin Luther wrote this. Here we see how Paul layeth himself out for poor Onesimus, and with all his means pleadeth his cause with his master, and so setteth himself as if he were Onesimus and had done wrong to Philemon, even as Christ did for us with God the Father. This also doth Paul for Onesimus to Philemon. We are all his Onesimi to my thinking. So Paul says, we are all Onesimus. We are all uh, runaway slaves uh, for whom another has paid the price, uh, Paul's own account. So imputation is simply a, a crediting to an account of uh, something which is already true. Uh, there are, in the Bible, three ways in which imputation is used. There is, first of all, uh, an imputation of uh, sin. So Adam sinned in the garden. As a result, I inherit original sin. Through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. That's a crediting or an imputing of sin uh, to, uh, to man. Our sin, <coughs> along uh, uh, not only the original sin, but also every sin we've ever committed, is credited to Christ. It's imputed to Christ on the cross. He himself bore our sins in his body. The atonement is a taking of the sins themselves. And Christ's righteousness is then imputed to us. So we see uh, arrows down, arrows up, arrows down. Righteousness will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Okay, imputation, fairly important word uh, used uh, a lot of times in the New Testament, particularly uh, with reference to our salvation. Uh, adoption. Uh, I've always liked this little girl. Uh, I think uh, that's, uh, that's Sally in the background. So I, I know this is at the center in, uh, uh, in Pampanga. But uh, Adoption is an act of God whereby the believer is received into relationship with him. Uh, notice there are two words that are, are kind of closely related. Uh, uh, we're said to be born again or regenerated, born into God's family. What's the difference between being born into a family and being adopted into a family? In the ancient world, uh, there's uh, there's a bit more going on uh, in the modern world. I can either be born into a family 
or adopted into a family. Uh, if, if you're born into a family, you don't need to be adopted. In our modern world, we, we distinguish those. In the ancient world, uh, adoption uh, could refer to either a, uh, a non-family member who is invited into the family, a child taken into the home and treated as one's own, or it could refer to a natural born child. Uh, and it had to do with the transference of the inheritance and the family responsibilities uh, onto a young person. The, uh, the Greek word in the New Testament for adoption is huiothesian. And I haven't written that down here. I probably should. Huiothesian literally translates into English as sun making. And the Weothesian ceremony took place in the gate of the city. Uh, a, a father would take his usually 13, 14, 15 year old son into the gate where the other men of the city were located. And he would declare to them, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you uh, uh, my son. This is my, my son in whom I am well pleased. From this day forward, you should hear him. He speaks with my authority. Uh, he has power over uh, his portion of my inheritance. And if he makes a, a contract with you, uh, he has the authority of the family uh, behind him. So adoption, is the, uh, the public and legal recognition of the, uh, uh, the position of a son within the larger family. Uh, and uh, this is never done before the, uh, the boy is old enough to actually begin doing business on his own. Uh, the adoption concept is a recognition by God uh, that this newly born again individual uh, is now a full-fledged, uh, good standing member of the family. So regeneration and adoption actually both happen uh, to uh, the new believer. Uh, we become the children of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Very cool. Uh, we are made God's own. We're showered with his tender care. The believer alienated from God is given the status of a legitimate child. It's a benefit and a blessing uh, of our justification and redemption. Okay, in the Greco-Roman world, a father and his children. Here we've got uh, a dad carrying one and, and the other one has just gotten uh, the keys to the chariot. I think uh, back in, in Roman days, a father was probably a little nervous about giving his son the car keys the first time. Uh, can you imagine you know, even back then, you know, here's, a, you know, here's the, uh, the keys to the chariot, son, be careful out there. You know, don't, uh, don't make me sad that I did this. Adoption confers the rights and privileges of the legitimate heir. Uh, it was irrevocable. That's an important element. Uh, later on, we're going to, to talk about the perseverance of the saints, the idea of uh, 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 unlosable salvation. Uh, adoption in uh, the Greco-Roman world was irrevocable. Uh, once a father has said either about a natural born son or a uh, an outsider who is brought into the family, once the adoption has been done, it's a legally irrevocable event. Uh, a child can never be uh, excommunicated or denounced. <coughs> you can't disinherit a child in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, so, 
this is a Roman adoption agreement from around 335 AD, which is interesting. I, Horian, acknowledge I hold and consider the child as my true son with regard to maintaining for him the rights of succession to my estate. It shall not be lawful for me to cast him aside. It shall not be lawful for us, Heracles and Isarion, to reclaim the child from you, Orion, because we have once for all given him over to you for adoption. So this is an adoption of a, of a child from outside the, the family, from uh, another uh, a set of parents. It, it's just an illustration, particularly of the irrevocability of adoption uh, in the ancient world. Okay, the biblical teaching. Uh, you know, here's a here's a dad and his a uh, little boy. There's something special about that. I'll tell you. Uh, God sent forth His Son so that He might redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption, the weothesian, as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, or Daddy, uh, Father. Uh, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Not a slave, but a son. If a son, then an heir. Uh, great teaching there. Ephesians 1. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. There's a lot of eternal purpose going on there. And adoption uh, comes uh, after regeneration and in the process of justification. Okay. Some benefits. What do you get if you're part of the family? Well, in this family, you get a ride on the bicycle, which I think is kind of cool. We are no longer children of wrath, but children of God. We have the privilege to approach the throne of grace because we're God's children. Of course, he'll see us. We enjoy the blessing of God's protection and care because what dad won't take care of his kids? We have the rights and blessings of being the sons and daughters of God. And we will experience fatherly discipline. You don't think you're going to get out of that. That happens. Okay, let's go on to sanctification. Sanctification comes from uh, uh, a root word, hagios, holy. Uh, that means uh, to be set apart. The saints are the hagioi, the set apart ones. Uh, the hagios essentially means set apart for a purpose. Uh, so uh, I was out uh, out working on my car this morning, and uh, when uh, uh, when I put um, a brake caliper back together, uh, I like to use a torque wrench uh, because a torque wrench allows you to put exactly the right amount of pressure on the part. You know, so torque wrenches are, are, are pretty important. And I've got a couple of torque wrenches out there. I've got one that I use for um, tightening down nuts on a, on a wheel, the lug nuts on a wheel. And it doesn't have to be very precise and it doesn't really matter too much uh, if it's off by uh, a bit. Uh, and if uh, uh, somebody else wants to use it, I'll loan it out. Uh, it's, it's not a holy torque wrench, okay? It's just a torque wrench. But I've got another little torque wrench uh, that is uh, calibrated in uh, inch ounces. As a very, it's a small one quarter inch drive torque wrench. And <clears throat> when I'm doing special work, I sometimes use that torque wrench. Uh, my other torque wrench, my big torque wrench, just sits in the toolbox, and I use it when I have to use it. But sometimes I use that little torque wrench. It sits in its own plastic case with a kind of a felt lining, uh, and uh, I have it calibrated so that it's exactly right. 
when I want to get something exactly right, like a brake caliper, I use that wrench to put exactly the right amount of torque on. That torque wrench is set apart for special uses only. Uh, woe be to the child in this household who uses that torque wrench uh, to open a can of paint or to drive a nail. Uh, there, there would be, oh, the wrath of daddy for sure uh, on uh, anybody who did a thing like that. Uh, the saints are, are not, not set apart because they're so good, but set apart because of God's work. Uh, sanctification is a work of God. Uh, it, uh, to sanctify someone or something is to set them apart. And by setting them apart, to make them holy. Uh, so my torque wrench is set apart for special use. It is therefore holy to me. Uh, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle and then in the temple, there were pieces of furniture that were set apart only for use in the tabernacle. They were holy. Uh, that's, that's what the word essentially means. The concept is twofold. Uh, because whenever we are set apart from something, we're also at the same time set apart to something. So my torque wrench is set apart from ordinary uses. I, I would never, never think to use it to drive a nail. I, it's set apart for very fine work on the car. I'm set apart from sin. That's a part of sanctification. But I'm also set apart to the worship of God. The, the point of the exercise is that I learn how to be a glory for God, a visible manifestation of God himself. And so in my journey through life, I'm leaving sin farther and farther behind. And I'm ascending toward a, a vision of the person of God himself. It's a, it's a process, it's a journey, it's an adventure. Uh, the sanctification process actually began with the event of salvation and regeneration that resulted in justification. Justification is done. That happened at the moment of salvation. Sanctification now is a journey. Okay. So then, my beloved, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Uh, Philippians 2, 12 and 13 is... Uh, really uh, the, the key verse on the, the whole sanctification concept, uh, the, the working out of salvation. I already possess salvation. Uh, that happened with justification. So I have it now. I'm going to heaven, uh, but I'm on a journey between where I am right now and where I'm going to be uh, when I finally get to heaven, whether, uh, whether I die and go into the presence of God, uh, whether I'm raptured up doesn't matter. Uh, I'm, I'm on my way to a relationship to God. And along the way, I will be held accountable for the work and for the growth and for the ministry that I have. At the same time that God holds me accountable, he also provides the resources of grace to work in me. It is God who is at work in me, both the will and to work for his good pleasure. He's doing this thing. Let's look at the next passage. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You have been saved. That's done. 
And that justification is not the result of works so that no one may boast. So sanctification is not the process leading to salvation, but is rather the process that happens after salvation. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, not as a result of good works, but for good works, which, he, uh, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Uh, I think if you, uh, if you spend some time ever talking to an honest Roman Catholic who has done some study of the scriptures, uh, if you ever find a, a Roman Catholic priest who is willing to, uh, to sit and talk to, a, to an honest Protestant uh, about this, you'll discover that uh, Roman Catholics aren't all that far from us. It's a different emphasis. They put the emphasis on the process. We put the emphasis on the event, but we do not deny the process. They put the emphasis on the process, uh, but they don't really deny the event. Uh, and it's a it's a fine balance. I think we're right and they're wrong, uh, but it's not as gigantic a difference as we sometimes think. Okay, sanctification, a little more. What is it? Okay, it's not following a set of rules that superficially define what is bad. Uh, so, you know, whatever it is. Instead, it's the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And so it's also a work of our own requiring vigorous effort on our part. So we've got a formal definition here that really ought to explain it for us. This is how the process uh, works. And uh, Hakama is Saved by Grace, which actually is quite a good book. We may define sanctification as that gracious operation of the Holy Spirit involving our responsible participation by which he delivers us from the pollution of sin, renews our entire nature according to the image of God, and enables us to live lives pleasing to him. Okay, pretty good definition. Let's uh, look at a diagram because I think it helps. Uh, the process starts out with a position. So here's a, here's a lady who uh, apparently has just washed her hair. So, you know, you're all clean. You've taken your shower, you're all clean. Hair is clean. Uh, the church of God at Corinth, Paul says, to those who have been, past tense, sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling. Okay, God has called us, and we are set apart. We've been sanctified. We call that positional sanctification. Experiential sanctification is the process of staying clean. Okay, if I took a shower yesterday, I've been out working in the woods. I need to take another shower today. Walk by the Spirit step by step over a period of time along a journey walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh in galatians 5 16. so this is an experience that we have day by day a process that is leading toward a final or complete or perfect sanctification uh, when we uh, finally get to heaven and go through the eastern gate meet jesus at that point, we will have arrived at perfection. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. As of course, is 1 John 3. Uh, there is a past tense, which is po uh, positional a present tense, which is our present experience, and a future tense, which is 
completion in heaven itself. All three are sanctification. All three are components of our salvation. Uh, and all three, we often need to ask ourselves the question, are we talking about our past tense, our present tense, or our future tense of salvation? Uh, and all three may be spoken of as the sanctification uh, process. So that's it there. Uh, next, uh, next Wednesday, we're going to go on to some more components of salvation. We'll be talking about the perseverance of the saints. I'm going to stop the share. Pers perseverance of the saints is sometimes referred to as once saved, always saved, but that's actually a bit more complex than that. Uh, and I'm going to want to take a look at that in some of the detail, particularly look at some of the scripture that's involved there. Uh, I hope that uh, the, the definitions aren't too boring. Knowing some of the details, I think you'll find is helpful, uh, but uh, I appreciate your attention. You guys are good at this. Uh, and uh, I always enjoy our sessions together. So we'll see you again on Wednesday. Uh, God bless to everybody. And uh, Oscar, keep those keep those great pictures coming. I love it. Don, good to see Thank you, Roger. Dan. Uh, Thank you so Joel. much. Okay, yeah, there's our, uh, there's Dan. everybody. I see Roger. Okay, guys. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.